we're back to our last session. And our first speaker is uh, Jonathan Belinkov. And uh, I know Jonathan from times that he was um, a PhD student at MIT and then a postdoc at Harvard and MIT. And he's done fantastic work on uh, natural language understanding. Um, and uh, he was also affiliated with the Mind Brain Behavior Initiative at, at, uh, at, at Harvard. And now he is uh, starting in the Technion, right? Uh, as a faculty member. And uh, he was really pivotal to this whole research, even though he doesn't realize it. But his talk at Radcliffe on uh, natural language processing, which was part of our um, mythical by now, <laughs> machine learning, mythical for us at least, machine learning uh, study uh, uh, was really what started this question of what are some other domains where the methods of NLP can be used, and specifically in this animal kingdom and in whales. So Yonatan, thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk and to tell us a little bit about NLP. Go for it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Jaffe, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you also, David and uh, Michael, for uh, inviting and uh, organizing this workshop. Uh, before I begin, I must also apologize to part of the panelists and participants for missing most of yesterday. I was able to catch part of uh, Michael's talk um, as I was driving in the car. So I, I hope I got the gist of it. Um, but uh, hopefully this um, message from NLP would be somewhat useful. I try to start with um, issues that are more closely related to my research research about interpretability, and then uh, I'll try to leave enough time to just point out a few other research topics uh, in natural language processing that I think could be useful to decoding communication in non-human uh, species. Um, so I assume you see my slides, but let me know if you don't. Uh, so the outline for this talk is first we'll present um, the current predominant approach to natural language processing, which is using very large scale language models. Some of it uh, Michael has already mentioned yesterday. Um, and I'll spend most of the time on uh, ways to interpret and analyze what's going on inside these models, uh, especially focusing on limitations of, um, of analysis methods. Uh, but then at the end of the talk will be a few other topics that I think could be relevant first about grammar induction, how you induce grammars um, generating language just from raw texts, uh, then unsupervised machine translation. So this is a scenario where you have um, two languages and you'd like to translate between them, but you don't have any example translations of the specific sentences or so-called parallel data. Um, it, it, amazingly, you can still do something. And um, finally, there's uh, interesting research going on on uh, artificial agents and what kind of language they develop when they um, are trained to accomplish some task, um, a cooperative task or competitive task. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so this is uh, how usually natural language processing works these days. Um, we have some kind of input uh, and some kind of output. Uh, and in between, there's a big artificial neural network. So this is a very large model, potentially complicated. And we train this model on these example input-output pairs um, by adapting all sorts of um, weights, uh, parameters in, inside this model. Now, this is uh, an example. Uh, if we're talking about machine translation, um, the input is some sentence in a, in a language such as Spanish in this case, and the output is a sentence in another language, uh, English in this case. And again, we'll uh, train the network on lots and lots of examples of uh, inputs and outputs. Now, uh, this seems um, fairly reasonable to do, but uh, historically, uh, things worked actually very differently. So um, up until something like five years ago, five or six years ago, uh, machine translation, for example, used to work very differently. Uh, we had these very complicated, uh, engin heavily engineered uh, systems with a lot of different uh, parts. You, you don't really need to go into the details of this diagram. Um, it's enough to understand that uh, we used to have all sorts of components for, in, a, in a very big model, uh, in a very big system. Um, for instance, if we're talking translation, we used to have 
um, a language model. That's something that predicts the probability of the next word. Uh, we had uh, lexicons and phrase tables, these are sort of dictionaries. Uh, we had some other component for reordering words because there are different word orders in different languages uh, and potentially many other uh, features that can each be integrated pertaining to morphology, syntax uh, or, or whatnot. Uh, now, the main uh, difference here is that in this uh, prior approach, we used to develop each of these components in isolation and then combine them in, in some way. And um, that worked out okay, but it, it does mean that each component is tuned to a different task and not necessarily to the task that, that we really care about, which is in, in this case, the machine translation task. Now go back to this end-to-end -end learning approach where you take an input, an output and uh, plug the input into a neural network. Here, um, the entire system is this neural network and it's all trained on the task. So if the task is to translate, everything in this model is tuned to, to do translation. So it's a um, very compelling uh, or very appealing uh, way uh, to accomplish this, uh, this task. Um, and it also ends up uh, working better uh, in practice. Uh, so this is all good and, and well. Um, here's a minor tweak on this idea. Um, so recently, uh, what we found out is that, uh, let me go back, this, this, uh, this idea still assumes that you have uh, lots of examples of whatever task you care about. So if we're talking about translation, we need a lot of example uh, translation. But what if, what if we only have a few of those or, or very little? Um, so here comes pre-training. Uh, the idea here is that we'll first uh, pre-train a model on some task. And in this case, we'll, we'll uh, des design tasks that are, it's very easy to collect data from. So for example, we can take a sentence like, Mary did not slap the green witch, um, but uh, mask out or blank uh, one of the words. And then what we'll ask is uh, ask the, the neural the big neural network to predict uh, the missing word or fill in the blank. This is a task that's uh, very easy to generate. You just need a lot of uh, texts, and um, occasionally you'll drop uh, out some words and, and mask them, and ask the model to fill in the blanks. Um, and it turns out that this uh, this idea leads to very good uh, models that can be used for then other tasks. So we'll take this neural network and um, that was trained, that was pre-trained on this filling the blank problem, and then we'll fine tune it, which means we continue tra uh, training it and adapting its parameters on some other tasks. So another task would be machine translation, question answering, or, or whatever. And um, usually, typically, this uh, other task will have much fewer data points, so um, uh, we don't have as many examples. But because we've already pre-trained uh, the model on lots and lots of uh, texts, we, uh, it turns out that it uh, has learned pretty good uh, representations for language that can be then adapted for very many different tasks. Um, so this uh, by now is, uh, I would say, uh, any state of the art result almost on uh, natural language processing works in, in this way. And I've listed a few uh, uh, to the side. Um, okay, so what's the problem? Uh, the one major issue that I'd like to mention is that this big model is uh, pretty opaque or, or often thought of as a black box. So we're not really sure what's going on in, in, with this model. Um, and we may want to ask very, a few different questions about this big uh, neural network model. Um, we might want to understand something about its internal structure. Uh, it is comprised of various uh, transformations, linear transformations, nonlinear transformations, arranged in layers with all sorts of connectivity. Um, what's going on inside? What's the role of different components? Uh, that's something that we just don't know because all these different components are all, remember, just trained to perform some end task, uh, such as translation. Um, we might want to ask how it uh, behaves on different data sets and different kinds of data and the natural language processing community now is starting to realize that it's important to uh, pitch this, these models against um, all sorts of stress tests and not just uh, measure their performance on some 
a common benchmark, but actually tease apart their behavior on uh, carefully curated example. Um, another uh, question is, why does it uh, predict what it predicts? So this model is trained to take an input and map it to an output, and then it generates a prediction. But why, what drives this prediction or, or this uh, decision? What part of the input perhaps influenced the, the decision? What internal computations happened that make the model arrive at such uh, prediction? And uh, also quite importantly, when can we say something about when would this model work well or, or not work well? Um, you may have heard of um, uh, adversarial examples or fragility problems. It turns out that a lot of these neural network models are very fragile. If you change a little bit the, the, the input, you insert some noise or you change it in a malicious way or a benign way, uh, things uh, break and, and things don't work well. So can we characterize this, um, these kinds of behavior? So th these are a lot of, these are a few different um, flavors of interpretability that people in the community are interested in. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'd like to focus on the first question, which is about the structure and how we can analyze uh, the uh, internal structure of uh, a deep neural network. Okay. Uh, so in a structural analysis, uh, we uh, take this uh, neural network, uh, some function, complicated function that maps an input to an output, and we would like to look at some particular uh, part of that. So for example, we might look at um, the output of the network at the ELF layer. So it's an intermediate step in its uh, computation. And then we could ask various kinds of uh, questions. We, we want to know uh, what is the role of different components uh, of this uh, neural network? What's the role of the particular layer that we uh, are observing? Um, what kind of information is captured in, in different components? Uh, these networks are trained on a, a lot of um, raw texts. Um, and it turns out that they generate representations which are useful for many different tasks. So presumably they acquire uh, some kind of uh, information about human language um, that is represented in some way internally in the model. Uh, so we'd like to be able to answer, uh, ask questions like, does a certain component uh, in the model know something about a certain property? And uh, components are things like layers, neurons, properties, uh, various linguistic um, features or linguistic properties. Um, they could be morphological patterns of words, syntactic structures of sentences, uh, compositional semantics, and, and so on. Okay, so um, here's uh, uh, the predominant uh, approach uh, these days. Uh, it's known as a probing classifier. The idea is that we will take this uh, um, model and we'll run it on a corpus of some inputs, X, um, um, which come with some linguistic annotations, uh, Z. Uh, so here we resort to a, a whole body of work in natural language processing and linguistics, which annotates um, various uh, properties on, uh, on different data sets. Um, so uh, we rely on supervised um, learning scenarios where people have already annotated uh, our data. And given this uh, annotated, uh, this, these linguistic annotations will take representations uh, from some part of the model and then train a little classifier, this uh, that I define here as G. Uh, what this does, it maps these representations to uh, the property that we are now studying. Um, and then we can train this as a supervised learning uh, scenario and evaluate the, the accuracy or some performance measure of this classifier G. And uh, this accuracy will be considered a proxy to the representation that uh, we are now examining. Um, so let's make this, I'll skip the information theoretic stuff, but let's make this a little more concrete. Um, this is a list of some references using this um, methodology and, and what uh, aspects they studied. So F here, is the neural network model that is being studied. X is the, uh, the inputs. Uh, y is the output of the neural network um, model F. Uh, 
that is the original output that uh, the model was trained on. And G is the classifier, uh, the probing classifier. And Z is the linguistic property that we are now studying. And you can see that we'll focus on the, the rightmost column Z. Um, there are various linguistic properties that have been studied in the literature, including morphological patterns, semantic calls, um, syntax, very syntactic features, uh, and so on. Uh, if we then uh, move to the left and look at the column F, uh, there are also various neural network uh, models that uh, have been studying using this methodology. Um, I'll just run through them quickly. If you're not familiar, that's not, not so important, but people have looked at various word embeddings, sentence embeddings. These are ways to represent words and sentences uh, mathematically as vector, multi, as high dimensional vectors, various kinds of uh, Deep neural nets like recurrent neural network um, models for machine translation, uh, tree based recurrent neural networks, and all the way to um, nowadays large pre trained models, uh, Elmo and Bert, and various Sesame Street uh, characters that are popular in, uh, in NLP these days. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, a very partial list, and by now, this idea of uh, trying to decode an information from a model using classifier is very common and there are probably dozens of, uh, of papers uh, or, or more uh, using this uh, methodology. Uh, so let me show you some example results from, from our own work. Uh, I'll show examples from uh, our work on machine translation and if you would like to look at various other examples then we have a survey which provides a big table, much bigger than the one I showed you, uh, and various categorizations of, um, of this kind of, uh, kind of work. Okay, so uh, how does this work in the machine translation case? Uh, we'll have this um, model F, which will be a recurrent neural network based encoder decoder um, model. And um, we have X and Y as the input and output. In this case, they are source and target sentences. Uh, meaning sentences in some source language and uh, their translations in a target language. Our classifier G will be a nonlinear classifier, in this case, a multi-layer perceptron. And I'll come back to the issue of what is the, uh, what kind of classifiers uh, we want to use uh, a little bit later, but for now it will be just this. Uh, and Z will be various linguistic properties of words uh, either in the source sentence X or the target sentence, target translation Y. And the first linguistic property uh, that we're asking, uh, we're looking at is morphology or the structure of, uh, of words. Uh, this is important for machine translation, uh, used to be solved with various uh, feature engineering approaches, and nowadays will just be the a neural network in, uh, seems to work well. So kind of natural to ask whether uh, neural nets acquire morphological knowledge. Um, in parentheses, I'll just note that the choice of which linguistic property or which property in general we are interested in depends on our uh, familiarity with the task, with the domain that we're uh, dealing with. So uh, if, if one is studying, um, if, if one is training a, a large language model on or a large sort of language model on the animal vocalizations, then one should have some prior conception on what kind of properties uh, would be interesting to look at. Um, and in our experiment, we'll look at um, the uh, FL of X. These are the representations from uh, the uh, neural network model at a certain layer L. And we'll try to predict the morphological properties. Um, this is a, 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 a complex morphological tag, for instance, saying that the current word is a verb, past tense, singular, feminine, uh, or it's a, it's a noun, uh, it's a plural noun. Um, okay. Uh, so this is a diagram showing this procedure, uh, just to visualize it a bit. The, we have three steps. First, we have to train uh, this uh, original model F uh, on example translations. Uh, then we'll generate feature representations from some internal uh, 
parts. For example, here we're taking the representations from the first layer um, in, a, in a deep model. And uh, finally, we train a, a separate classifier on these representations um, to predict some property. For, for example, here we're predicting the part of speech. And so we like to say that the word we is a pronoun and not a noun or a verb. Okay, so let me show some results. Um, so these are results on predicting morphology and the y-axis is accuracy. X-axis is uh, showing various kinds of models in different languages, language pairs, German English, Czech English, Spanish English, and, and so on. Within each um, group, the different colors indicate the layers from which we took the representation. Uh, lighter layers, lighter colors indicate layers at the bottom, so close to the input. And um, darker colors indicate layers at the uh, top, so close to the output, um, except for the very dark, uh, uh, the very dark, uh, darkest uh, color that we can ignore for now. But uh, omitting this, uh, the pattern that we see is that um, the accuracy decreases with layer depth. So lower layers are better in terms of uh, having morphological information in them that we can actually uh, decode. Which is, in fact, uh, when we first saw this result, we were quite surprised because the common assumption is that uh, deeper models perform better, so you need the deeper, the deeper layer, uh, the deeper layers. But here there's an example where, at least for the uh, question of morphological knowledge, the deeper layers are not where most of it ha is happening. So Jonathan, I don't understand. Yes. The Can you explain a little bit? So in the, on the on the x-axis, I see that the, which language is, but but the y-axis, which is what you what are you trying to predict exactly? And yeah, so, so the y. Uh, so let me go back here. We're predicting the uh, morphological information of a word uh, oh, based on the representation. So for for example, if we have the word we, we predict the morphological information, or in, in this case, it's uh, saying that we is a pronoun. Yeah, um, but you're doing two languages, the, English to Czech. So what's that's how does that play in there? Sorry? But you are on that on that graph, you have two languages. So you have Yes. Um so in the right. So in the translation case, we have two languages, a source language and a target language. So for example, look at the leftmost side, German English. That means we start with German sentences and translate them to English. Um, all of these models kind of skipped over that, but all of these models are made of an encoder and a decoder. And the encoder is uh, a part of the network that encodes the source language into some vector representation. And the decoder takes this vector representation and generates the target translation. So the encoder works on the, on the German side, in the case of German English, and the decoder works on the, um, on the English side. And what you see here is that the first four um, groups are what our analysis of the encoder representation and the last four are analysis of the decoder representation. Um, so we can extract those representations from any part of the model with, that we want. Here we looked at representations either coming from the encoder side or from the decoder side. And the accuracy is in the mapping, let's say, from verb in English to verb in Czech or something? Uh, no, so the accuracy well, I'm actually not showing how you how good the model is in translation. Um, that's that's not shown here. The, this accuracy is showing the accuracy of this classifier, which we call a probing classifier, uh, which is something that we that comes after the model has been trained on translation. But we ask this classifier, how good can you predict? Can you decode certain properties? So in this case, this is a classifier that tries to take a, represent, a vector representation of a word from in, from the model this thing here in the middle and predict the part of speech or the morphological information of, of the word corresponding to this representation. So this is an auxiliary way to say, um, some, to, to give us some quantitative information of the quality of this representation with respect to a particular linguistic property. Is that uh, clear now? Yes. Okay. Um, so the main the main takeaway from here is that 
we see this uh, decrease in accuracy as we as we increase the layer or as we go deeper into uh, into the model and this is a, a, a bit of a peculiar behavior because we know that deep deep models are, are good I mean that's what the, the whole deep learning is, is about so um, the natural follow-up question is uh, what's going on in the top layers if they're not about um, if they're not really representing morphological knowledge really well, what do they do? Um, so what, what we found out is that uh, you can vary the properties and, and figure out other aspects uh, of language. Um, so here I'm showing a, a very similar graph in its structure, but what we're trying to predict here is the syntactic uh, patterns in, in, the, in the sentences. In particular, um, if you're familiar with this, what we're predicting here is syntactic dependencies or relations. So given two words, we would like to say what's the relationship between them. Um, the relationship can be, for example, if a, a, a relationship of a subject and a verb or an op, a direct object or an indirect object or um, uh, you know, various other syntactic uh, relations. But if that is not very familiar, that's fine. The main point here uh, is that we're predicting um, something about the structure of the sentence and how words combine with one another to form larger meaningful units. And um, again, the y-axis is the accuracy in predicting uh, this, these syntactic relations. And uh, you can see the pattern is quite different here. Uh, again, darker colors indicate deeper layers. So if we go from left to right in each block, we see that the accuracy goes up. Um, in other words, deeper layers are better in terms of having representations that contain syntactic information. Um, so this is a differentiation between syntax and, and morphology that we've, uh, we've found. Uh, and we've also looked at semantic uh, properties, uh, semantic relations. These are predicate argument relations to those familiar with them. Um, and they seem to behave quite similarly to the, the syntax case. So again, deeper layers lead to better representations in terms of how much semantic information they contain. Uh, we did, so we, what we see here is a separation between morphology on one side, uh, this is better represented at lower layers and syntax and semantics at, uh, on the other side. Um, we've started looking at uh, how to tease apart the difference between syntax and semantics, but didn't do much work uh, about that. So I'll, uh, I'll skip that for now. Uh, so to summarize this part, uh, what appears to be happening in these uh, deep language models is that they learn sort of hierarchy of, of language properties where uh, this hierarchy uh, corresponds to some notion of how language works. Uh, you can imagine that uh, at the bottom of the hierarchy are uh, uh, simple lexemes or uh, lexical units um, uh, such as words and their parts uh, and then as you go deeper into the hierarchy first you may uh, combine parts to form uh, words uh, then combine words to form phrases and relations and full syntactic trees and perhaps uh, go uh, deeper or higher into that uh, into discourse units propositions and uh, and so on uh, so this is a, a sort of language hierarchy that corresponds to the layers, at least partially corresponds to the layers in, in the deep model. And we call that this deep neural network uh, was only trained on some input output pairs, which in our case were the translations. We, didn't, we never told the, this network who, um, how to represent uh, parts of speech, morphology or syntax. Uh, we especially never said uh, we never told, indicated that, that a certain property should be represented at a certain component. Um, and if this is a little familiar, then you may, uh, you may recall from uh, computer vision that in, uh, in the deep neural nets that uh, process uh, images, uh, often uh, there are also, there's a sort of a vision hierarchy, uh, shallow layers close to the input, uh, capture simple properties of images or objects such as uh, edges and, uh, and parts. And as you go deeper into uh, the, the network, you get full objects or even complicated uh, scenes. Um, there are also sort of similar, sort of similar signs uh, 
uh, happening on the speech side. And, and I think that might be interesting to, to people um, in the studying uh, animal communications, but uh, a, a sort of speech hierarchy that we're seeing is where uh, simple features, articulatory features happen at the bottom and uh, phonemes uh, are represented at the middle or higher layers of, um, uh, of models. Okay. Um, so, so far uh, about results that we've seen, uh, I'd like to go into a bit uh, about the limitations of, uh, of this approach. So uh, a quick uh, recap. Um, the setup is that we have some deep neural network model F word, which is then trained to map uh, inputs uh, to outputs. And we have uh, a separate classifier G, which takes those feature representations coming from F and, uh, and learns to decode them into a linguistic property Z. Um, and uh, I, I've glossed over this, but mathematically, it turns out that what, what G does is it maximizes the mutual information between those representations F and, uh, and property Z. Uh, so here are some questions. Uh, I've shown you all these accuracies um, but uh, of morphology and so on, but what do they mean? Uh, and in, in, uh, specifically, uh, how do we put these accuracies in perspective? What should we compare this accuracy to? So a lot of studies focus on relative performances, which is what we've, uh, we've done in our example. We looked at um, the same property, the same setup and classifier and so on, but we compared representations coming from different layers. And then we could say um, some layers lead to better representations in terms of this decoding accuracy that we, we get. Uh, but if we get an, a number such as 76, what does it mean? Is it good? Is it, is it bad? Um, so it's often useful to have some external numbers to compare that to. And some common baselines that are used are um, using random features. It, it turns out that if you take a deep neural net, which is random, meaning it was never trained, it still generates uh, a pretty useful feature representation. So that's uh, kind of a naive baseline, but it's a pretty good baseline um, uh, to work with. And, and you could also compare the deep neural net to simpler kinds of word representations. For instance, word embeddings that are non-contextual. Uh, we work with machine translation models and most people these days work with contextual representations where the representation of a word depends on its context, but um, a useful baseline is to compare with a non-contextual uh, word representation. Um, th so these are kind of baseline or, or lower bounds, we would like to verify at least that uh, our probing accuracy is above this lower bound. Um, it's also useful to look at tie lines uh, or some upper bounds. So often you will see people reporting the, just the state of the art on the task. So how good can you um, do, how well can you perform on predicting morphological information? Just if, you, if all you care about is predicting morphological information, forget about the the original model F, just train the model to, to do morphological tagging. And, um, and, and this presumably will, de, will do better than our probing classifier because it's not constrained to do anything else. Uh, but if we compare our result to the skyline, we, we know how far we are and how perhaps how much information is, is missing from the representation. Okay, so that's a certain uh, question. Um, it turns out that just looking at the accuracy is not, is not a very good um, number to look at. Uh, in particular, the, an interesting study by uh, people from Stanford found that um, you, a, lo a lot of what these models do is memorize um, what they see in the, in the data and, and simply memorize word types. So they designed a very clever control task, which is a task that only the, uh, the classifier G, spoken classifier G can learn, but the original model F cannot. And specifically what they asked this classifier to do is they said, well, um, given all the words in, uh, that, that you look at, uh, assign a random label to each word, uh, word type. So every, every word will always appear with the same label, but this is a random label. And, and the classifier G can learn that because it's, it's being shown these random labels. The original model had no notion of those 
labels whatsoever, so it, it cannot possibly know anything about it. And the point that they're making is that a good probe, a good G, should have very uh, high accuracy on the real task that we care about, such as predicting morphology, but it should have low control accuracy. So it should not be very good at just assigning random labels because this is a meaningless uh, task that can be solved by just memorizing. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the, these uh, results here, but uh, it, they, they've shown that if you look at the, this measure of selectivity that they define, uh, you get uh, somewhat different results from just looking at the accuracy. So accuracy is not always the, the correct measure uh, to look at. Um, another question that is, uh, I think I mentioned a bit, is the kind of classifier G that we should use. Uh, what kind of classifier should we choose? And how does that affect the relationship between the, the classifier and the original model F? Um, and a common uh, thing to do that you see in the literature is to just use a linear classifier. Uh, and, and the idea is that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to analyze the representations um, and how good the representations coming from the original model F are. Um, and we're not necessarily trying to get the best possible classification accuracy. So we shouldn't have a very complicated um, uh, probing classifier uh, G. Anecdotally, um, I could say that it seems not to matter too much which classifier to use because um, if, if what you care about are the relative uh, performances, say which layer is, is better, then usually the, the identity of the classifier doesn't matter much, but that's um, not a very comprehensive study. Um, okay, there's some theoretical uh, work on, on this question of, of the uh, probe G that I think I will uh, skip uh, here. Um, but I would like to mention this, this uh, new work um, from uh, Voida and Tidev. Uh, so they had a, a very interesting idea. Uh, we have this classifier G and it can be a linear classifier, nonlinear classifier, whatever, and, and we get an accuracy. Um, but there's a very big difference between different classifiers. And a nonlinear classifier is much more expressive. It can do a lot more. It has a lot more going for it. Maybe that's why it's getting this higher accuracy. Uh, so what they uh, suggested is to measure not only the quality of the classifier, but also its complexity. Um, and uh, to do that, they uh, uh, use a minimum description length estimator, uh, which uh, means Suppose you uh, want to uh, take the property Z and transmit information about that to someone else, uh, assuming that, some, that someone knows um, the, the representation F, uh, coming from F. Um, how expensive is it to transmit the information? So uh, this is the minimum description length and, and they show uh, ways to estimate it and uh, end up reporting two numbers. Uh, one is just the accuracy or some similar measure, which is quality of the classifier G. This is how well you can uh, predict a property from the representation. Uh, and the other quantity is the description length, meaning how hard was it to train this classifier to, to obtain this, um, this predictor. Um, and I think this is a very neat idea that probably will, will stick in the literature. They also show that uh, it's important to look at this um, idea of the uh, min minimal description length because you, you get different insects. Um, for instance, you, you may think that um, the a certain layer is very good in uh, predicting and that may indeed, indeed be the case, but sometimes you'll see that this comes at the expense of having a very complicated uh, code or a very complicated description, um, meaning that it was pretty hard to achieve this, uh, uh, this, um, this prediction. Uh, or oh, in other words, you could say, uh, if we look at the representations coming from the model F, sure, they may contain the information necessary to predict the property Z, but it's so, um, uh, in, it's, it's encoded in such a difficult way, in such a hidden way that it's very difficult to extract it and you, and you need to work a lot. Can um, I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. So, 
uh, when you talk about how many bits are required, so is this analytic work or again, it's empirical? Um, this is an empirical work. Mm -hmm. So you can't really analytically say because it all depends on how good your classifier is. Uh, and we have a limited sample. Um, so we have to estimate it empirically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a limited knowledge scenario. So I don't think we could, uh, we could give like an analytical No, but even answer. this thing about how many bits are required to transmit Z knowing F of X, there's a, it's an estimate, it's, it's an eyeballing kind of thing or is it? Uh, no, no, it's not an estimate. It's not an eyeballing kind of thing. It's, it's more like they show that you can, uh, they, they prove that this, uh, well, I don't know if proof is worth it, but they show that you can approximate this question by looking at the difficulty of training the classifier. So they have, they have a couple of different ways to do that, but you can imagine if, if, it's, if, it's, a, if it's very difficult to train a classifier, then you need more and more bits. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the last question, uh, which I think is the most exciting one, is uh, what, kind of what kind of insight we get from this sort of this whole sort of analysis uh, of, of the probing classifiers. Um, what this does is, again, recall we have a, a representation F and we're training a classifier G to predict some property Z. What, what we end up getting is some sort of correlation between the representation coming from the model and the property Z. Or in other words, this isn't telling us anything about how the original model F was, uh, would behave on the task it was trained on. Recall it was trained, it wasn't trained on anything to do with the linguistic property Z. It was trained on some other input output pairs X and Y, for instance, translation. So uh, when I showed you the results on analyzing machine translation, I said something about morphology and syntax and so on, but it wasn't connected to the, the actual translation task in, in any way. And in fact, some people found that. Um, there is either a no correlation or even sometimes a negative correlation between how good the probe is and how good the model performs on the task. It's kind of undermining a bit this endeavor. Um, so an alternative direction for uh, analyzing these, uh, these models is to perform interventions in their representation. Uh, if, we perf if we intervene on what the representations are and then um, see how this affects the, the predictions, the, their behavior, then we can say something causal. We can say that, sure, this representation affects the, 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 the model behavior in a certain way. And um, I think this is a, a very promising way to go. Uh, and I've listed here a few papers, including some of our recent work, uh, if you're interested in, in looking more into this. Okay. Uh, so I think this is, looks like I have a bit more time. This is perhaps a good point to stop before I move to some other uh, stuff. If there are any questions, I can perhaps answer one or two. Uh, I think there's one question in the chat by Juba. Uh, can you um, see that? Let's see. Actually, I only see the Q&A. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see the chat. Okay. So there's a question by Brandon. Which languages tag are you trying to predict? Does accuracy on the other languages tag improve as the first decreases? Um, I think so. I think this is probably referring to the translation case. Um, so let, me, let me go back that. So uh, what we did here, we, we tried to be fair when we compare the encoder and the decoder performances. So on the left hand side, these four first blocks, we're looking at the encoder representations uh, of these non-English languages like German to German, Czech, Spanish, and French. So it's translating from German to English or from Czech to English. And we're looking at the morphological uh, the morphology quality on German or in English. Uh, on the 
four last uh, blocks, we're looking at the decoder side, but here we flip the, the order of the languages. So here, this is a translation model translating from English to German. And then we look at the decoder side representation, meaning we're again looking at German uh, morphology. So we actually predict both of them. Um, I don't have a direct answer to what happens to accuracy on the other language languages tag as, as the first decreases. Uh, we, I don't think we've looked at that. Okay. So I'll skip go back. All right, so in the time remaining, uh, I'd like to mention a few other uh, issues from NLP that might be relevant to, to this workshop. Uh, a couple of discla disclaimers. This is not a representative um, presentation of any of these uh, topics. Firstly, because it's not of time, but most importantly, because I'm not an expert on, on these. So um, there may be omissions or misrepresentations. So uh, take this um, carefully, but hopefully there, there are enough references to be useful for some follow-up discussions. Uh, so the first problem that I think is interesting to consider is called grammar induction. So in, in grammar induction, we're given a collection of strings and we need to infer grammar generating those strings. Uh, usually in, in, in NLP, we are given a corpus of sentences, uh, such as the sentences listed here on the left, and which we'd like to infer grammar generating them. For example, it might be a context-free grammar. And uh, you, you might have a, a different kind of um, data, data set and different kind of um, grammar, but this is what's commonly done. Um, so you're giving all these sentences on the left and you'd like to say, uh, you'd like to infer a grammar of this sort uh, that has rules. Rules are things like S goes to NTVP, so this is a, sent a sentence and it goes to a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Uh, the, noun, the NT goes to that NP, so the noun phrase go goes to a determiner and another noun phrase. VP is a verb phrase and it goes to a verb and a noun phrase and so on and so forth. So these um, non-terminals uh, that are listed here have some meanings linguistic meaning. Uh, of course, this is an unsupervised problem. And uh, we only have those, recall, we only have those sentences on the left. So we don't know any of the rules. We don't even know what are the non-terminal types. So we don't know anything about noun phrase or verb phrase or, or the terminal, all that stuff. Uh, so the most we could hope for is perhaps to get something that looks like this. Some, some non-terminals that we don't have any meanings to associate with. But this is the problem. Uh, and and this, this problem has all sorts of cognitive appeals uh, as well as perhaps some engineering appeals, but it's, it's a major problem in computational linguistics. Uh, it is in fact a very difficult problem. So for instance, in English, it turns out that it's very difficult to beat a very trivial baseline that takes a, a, a sentence and always derives it with a right branching, right branching tree. So this is this uh, naive baseline works actually pretty well. Um, and if you have a different kind of word order language, then you might have a, a, another very simple baseline like a left branching uh, tree. Um, but still, there are a lot of there's a lot of work on this. Uh, there's work on inducing constituency structures uh, of such as uh, trees derived by um, context-free grammars. There's a lot of work on dependency structures that, um, if you're familiar with those. Uh, they, they are a somewhat different uh, syntactic formalism. Um, I've listed here some, all these are hyperlinks that uh, I'm happy to share and people can follow up on, but there's a timeline of various uh, advances. And uh, recently there have been a few advances using uh, deep neural networks, uh, including um, uh, latent variable models that uh, are quite exciting. Uh, so here is uh, a table of uh, recent results from Kim et al. Um, these results are, uh, this is a F1 measure of the quality of the inferred um, uh, trees that correspond to some grammar. Uh, so the, it doesn't matter how we compute it, but higher is better. That's the, the main point. Um, and if you look at the top, uh, you will see all sorts of previous models. Um, what I'd like to highlight here is the right branching baseline is 39.5. So you can see that up, to, up until 2018, it wasn't 
nobody actually really beat this, um, this uh, naive baseline, but recently there are quite a few advances where things go up to the 40s and 50s. This particular paper goes all the way to 60 or something like that. So it seems like we're getting there, uh, but we're still quite far. So oracle trees as a sort of estimation of how good um, humans would be. And uh, this is still quite, there's still quite a, back, a gap. Um, but perhaps some of these uh, ideas could be useful in inferring a grammar on a sort of a different communication. Uh, I think it, it would require stipulating what kind of grammar at least it should be. I, I don't know if there's a lot of uh, understanding of whether animal communications are uh, regular language, correspond to regular languages, context-free languages, and, and so on. Uh, okay, uh, on to a different uh, question. Um, machine translation. Uh, the usual machine translation setup, which uh, I've mentioned a bit, is such that we have a parallel data set of source sentences and their target translation. Then we learn a translation model. This is a supervised learning setup. So we have labels. Labels are those target translations. Um, but this is a very strong assumption and we don't have all those labels for many different language pairs and, and languages. And so uh, recently some people have looked at this question of what to do if we don't have any parallel data. So here we are given two data sets, one in each language, and we need to learn how to translate between the two languages. So imagine you're giving a bunch of texts in Spanish and a bunch of texts in English, but there's no correspondence between them and you somehow need to learn to translate. So this is an unsupervised learning setup. And, and honestly, it sounds impossible. Uh, it turns out that it can work somehow. Uh, so just in the last couple of years, there have been a uh, couple of uh, recent papers on, um, on doing this. Uh, and I think, I think some of this was mentioned also by uh, Michael yesterday. Uh, the idea is that we take those neural networks and, and um, ask them to do encoding and decoding in a particular way. Specifically, uh, these papers use autoencoder. So uh, these are models that start from some input and encode it into some uh, vector presentation, but then go back to the input. And you interleave those autoencoders with uh, encoder decoders, meaning um, um, parts of the model that encode a, a, a sentence and decode it or generate a different translation. Uh, so as long as you make sure that the encoder is shared, they should learn a, a similar representation for different languages. Um, take this with a few other tricks um, and somehow this seems to magically work. And you can learn a model that translates encodes sentences from different languages into a vector space which is shared and then decodes them into uh, the different languages. Uh, I, I want to highlight that all of these models rely on some, something that I call an anchor, which is some way to get some initial mapping. Uh, usually what they do is they have word embeddings uh, that are bilingual. So at least we know for, uh, we, we have uh, word vector representations for words in two different languages and a mapping between them. So we know which, uh, how to map one to another. And that, that is something that, um, perhaps it's not trivial to achieve if we're gonna to want to translate from whale sounds to human language. Um, so this is, uh, this is a neural approach. Uh, it turns out that you can go back to the old style uh, statistical machine translation models of the sort that I showed in the beginning of this talk uh, with a lot of moving parts and components and it still works. You can do unsupervised machine translation and even sometimes better than the neural network approach. Uh, but again, there is an anchor of these bilingual word representation. Uh, so how well does it, this work in practice? Here is a, a table of results on machine translation quality. These are called blue scores. The higher is better here. Uh, at the bottom, you see a couple of supervised approaches. So this is, you are giving translations in, at, the, at the training time. Uh, we, can, we can focus on this English-German pair. You get up to 35. Uh, and the unsupervised results gets to 22. So is it, is it good or bad? Uh, as a comparison, you can see here this 20. This used to be the state-of-the-art supervised approach in 2014. 
So by now you can um, learn an unsupervised translation model, which is as good as the best supervised model from a few years ago. Uh, I think it's quite impressive. Okay, last uh, topic for today um, is uh, artificial agent communication. Uh, so this is again a field with a long history. The question here is how to build artificial agents that can communicate about some goal. Um, and if they do communicate, what are the properties of their, the, the, um, the communication protocol that they end up learning? Um, so we, we don't tell them uh, what is the protocol, but we ask them to develop some sort of communication protocol. Uh, to give proper credit, this part is, draws very heavily on this very nice overview paper by Lazaridou and Baroni, so I encourage you to, to go look at that. Uh, so here are some example problems in uh, emergent communication in artificial agents. Uh, this, uh, let's start with this. We have two agents, a sender and a receiver. Um, they get uh, an input representation, so they, they get some vector, and they need to um, transmit a message in discrete symbols about this. So this message uh, ZAB, and then the receiver uh, needs to predict the, the representation. So this is a very simple simulated problem that was considered many years ago. Now things become a little more complicated um, as the years pass by. So here we have two agents uh, with some utilities regarding an object um, and uh, certain quantities to the object and the two agents need to negotiate uh, between them about how to, use, how to divide the, the quantities in, of these objects. Um, and they do so via, again, some symbolic language, some symbols that they exchange. Um, you can also look at agents in a simulated uh, uh, problem. So here they, uh, they, they have a couple of five agents that are in a maze and they need to find um, an apple and they have certain goals and they can communicate about these um, all the way up to more realistic scenarios. So perhaps we have agents in real um, or oh, in, in diagrams of um, in 3D, uh, uh, 3D environments, and they need to navigate and achieve some sort of, uh, of, uh, of goal. But they do so by communicating uh, in the symbolic language. Okay, um, so the main components in those AI agents these days uh, are three. There's usually a visual processing component, which is uh, a deep convolutional neural network takes an input image and generates some representation. There's a symbol generation component that, that takes some um, rep uh, uh, representation uh, and generates the symbols that will describe it. And there's an, uh, an understanding component takes the symbol and generates a representation. So you can take those different components and kind of build an, uh, an agent that can process the images generate symbols and understand symbols that uh, are transmitted to it by another agent. Um, some of the challenges in this are uh, in understanding this language that emerges are how to even segment the messages. What are the units? What are the words, sentences, characters, and so on? What do the units mean? What do they refer to in the real world? Um, are they consistent internally? Uh, I like this quote from this uh, paper saying that this enterprise is like linguistic fieldwork, except that we're dealing with an alien race with no guarantees that any universals of human communication will apply. Um, so I, I also like this because maybe that tells us that some of the techniques here can, can be applied to not alien races, but um, animal, animal species. Um, in terms of analyzing this emergent communication, there's a lot of work on questions of compositionality. But the main question is, is this agent, can this agent express novel concepts beyond what it had seen, but compose them from familiar parts, which is also, I think, an important language for any language, uh, any language research. Okay, uh, I think that's all I had. Uh, so uh, thank you. If there are any questions, I'm not sure we have much time, but uh, we can try. So you have a whole bunch of questions in the, in the chat. Chat, okay. Let me go there. Uh, there's also some questions in the Q&A, but I think more in the chat. I think you okay. go all, all the way to 12.07. Yep. 
Uh, so there's a question from Luigi. Have you tried to apply this work to explore how metaphors and rhetoric figures are learned? It would be interesting to explore there's a gradient of meaning uh, that then is categorized in another category rather than an express one. Um, there's a clarification. I mean, to explore which layer would capture more information about the literal meaning of the sentence, which one would categorize them in a figurative meaning? Yes, uh, this is a very good question. I personally have not dealt with that. Um, there is not so much work on metaphors and rhetoric in, um, in NLP, although there is a bit, and I think there's a workshop on figurative language in NLP that has started in the first in the last couple of years. So this is maybe a bit premature, but hopefully there will be more. Uh, there's a, there was a question from Shafi, but I think Shafi says I answered it. So I could um, skip that. And then Q&A, go... you have a few also. Yeah. Okay, I'll go to the Q&A. 1202. Um, there was a question by Maximilian that seems to have been answered, so I'll skip that. Then there's a question from John Payne. Do you think the void and tide of approach could be important for practical training since it could indicate which layers are doing better? Higher ratio of accuracy to complication of encoding. Yes, um, that's a very good idea. So the, this void and tide of idea approach was to not only say the quality of the representation based on the classifier, but also tell us something about the complexity. Um, and yes, in fact, that tells us something about how difficult it was to extract in the information from the encoding. Uh, so if you know that, you could perhaps improve training. The question is how, in, in general, uh, many of the insights that we get are super interesting, but not always very actionable. So I think this is still a challenge for the community. There's a question from Peter about, do the hierarchy results still hold when trained on non-European languages? Um, yes, this is a good question. And okay, so first let me say there's unfortunately not a lot of work on non-European languages, not even on non-English languages. So most of the work is on English, although I've shown results on other languages. In, in the ones I've shown, I only, European, although they were from somewhat very different groups, so recall that there was Czech in there. Uh, there's also, we've also experimented with Chinese and did see quite similar results in terms of the, of the hierarchy to the extent that some of these aspects exist or, or don't exist. Um, so my answer would be kind of, but more work is needed to answer. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Um, I guess there was there's another question in the chat from Azan Raskin. Thoughts on if or how emergent communication in AI agents be constrained in such a way so that it better approximates specific animal vocalization? I think that would be a question more for the experts on animal vocalizations than to me. Um, so I, I will refrain. But if you have any thoughts, I'm happy to hear. Just one question. Oh, yeah, I have a question. This unsupervised, it may be to you, it may be to Michael, but this unsupervised way of uh, um, training these uh, different languages in order to do language to language translation, how similar should these language be in order to generate this similar type of embedding? Yeah. And the assumption um, here is that they generate that they are transformed into a similar type of embedding, right? Right. Using some unsupervised. First of all, are they enforced? Are there some supervised examples that enforce these embeddings to be the same under these supervised examples, or is it totally unsupervised? But then there must be some assumption that the these embeddings are similar, and I, it's okay if the languages are relatively similar, but I wonder if they're very very different differently structured languages if this would still hold. Yeah, this I think this is a very good point. So you, you can see here in the table, the languages that uh, people usually experiment with are Fre French English um, and German English. So these are pretty similar. Um, you know, at least they have the same writing systems and some of the grammatical structure is also the same. And if I go back to the how this is done, you know, they have all these, there's all sorts of complicated 
um, topologies of, of networks and objective functions and so on, but there is this anchor of bilingual word embedding. So the, the building blocks um, are mapped in a pre in a pre-processing step. So so first we assume that we have word embeddings from two different languages which are aligned in in, in vector space. So how do you get those? Um, that's a, that's another question. And, and there are almost unsupervised ways to get those. You could train them separately, train those word embeddings separately on two different languages and then align them. Um, do the alignment. Yeah, so, so what, what ends up happening, if you, if you look into the details, and I hope that I'm faithful to the work, uh, but what, what ha ends up happening is that eventually they have some very, very small seed uh, lexicon uh, of words that they manually uh, align. And this seed lexicon, for, ex for example, could be just digits. So in some cases, you just see digits because digits are spelled the same in, in, in the different languages that they've experimented with, experimented with. But it is a, it is a limitation. There's still some hum, human involvement on a, a supervised step, so to speak. Uh, small, but still, it's there. I guess my question uh, is that they yeah, have no, I think uh, if, if I remember correctly, uh, they had a follow up paper where they didn't do any, uh, any landmarks, uh, uh, any corresponding words. So it was really uh, unsupervised. And uh, from what uh, I also remember, and uh, again, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, first, I'm not an expert in NLP, and second, I, uh, uh, I might be distorting the, the details of the paper. So it's better to look it up. But uh, from what I remember, the claim was also that the more languages you add, the better. So if you, have, if you try to align simultaneously multiple languages, then, uh, uh, then it helps. So I, I, I think- oh, so, I, so I, that, thanks, for, thanks for this uh, clarification. So it's obvious, maybe I have a, a gap in my, in my knowledge here. So um, I was going to ask more questions, but I think we're way over schedule. So let's thank Jonathan again. Thank you. 